Hi, I'm Codex, and in this video, I'm going to be talking about using Skull Splitter versus using Sudden Death when you don't have Wind Fury. So I just posted my Remnant of Nerzul tips and tricks video, and I got a comment from Tom Mitag, and he asked about the fact that there's apparently a lot of people saying that even if you don't have Wind Fury, it's still better to go Sudden Death and then just Charge Weave optimally, and it'll be better than Skull Splitter. Now, I replied to his comment, and I'm going to basically rehash what I said there, but then I want to expand on it because there is a bigger principle unto how I look at things and why I make certain decisions about what abilities that I use and what rotations that I do and my sort of priorities in that regard, which has the knock-on effect of being things that I recommend in my guides that are going to differ from guides of other content creators such as Arkham Tiros or Correo or whoever else. So let's obviously start by talking about Skull Splitter versus Sudden Death and Charge Weaving. So just on paper, looking purely at the value provided by Sun Death versus the value provided by Skull Splitter, Skull Splitter provides us with rage that we can then convert into more damage, and then there's also the damage that it does itself, which is equivalent to what a slam will do. And it will be able to provide its value once every 14 global cooldowns. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to use it every 14 global cooldowns, but that is the upper limit of the value that can be provided by it, right? It's a slam every 14 GCDs plus 20 rage every 14 GCDs. In the best case scenario, the damage provided by the 20 rage that you get from Skull Splitter is either going to be the value of two thirds of a rend or two thirds of a mortal strike. Sure, it could technically be considered equal to a full slam, but that will be a less efficient use of that rage. Keep in mind also that because this rage will then get spent, it has a chance to proc Tactician, meaning that we're going to be able to use Overpower, which then also has the knock-on effect of increasing the damage of Mortal Strike. So there's a really long compounding value provided by getting that extra rage. On the other hand, there is Sudden Death, which allows us to fill a global cooldown, and it does a 40 rage execute for free. And because of the proc rate, it is definitely somewhat random, but in general, you're going to be able to use Sudden Death more often than you would Skull Splitter. But because it doesn't cost any rage, it doesn't have a chance to proc Tactician, and it doesn't give you rage, so then you can't spend it on other things that could, again, proc Tactician. So if you played Let's Pretend, and you pretended that you had both Sudden Death and Skull Splitter, and you had a GCD where you could use either of them, then if you look at the just the value provided by Sudden Death versus the value provided by Skull Splitter in that GCD, you're going to see that Sudden Death provides more value, because the damage of a 40 Rage Execute is more than the value of a Slam plus two-thirds of a Mortal Strike. But obviously we don't live in Pretend Land where we have both Sudden Death and Skull Splitter, so we have to decide between which one we pick. Well, the thing is, is that if you don't have Wind Fury, there's going to be a lot more global cooldowns that you have available to you where you don't have enough rage to use a slam safely without risking rage starving yourself. So if we were able to do something such that we were able to get enough rage to not rage starve ourselves, then Sudden Death would be better. Well, we do in fact have a way of doing that. It's called Charge Weaving, which is the practice of running out of melee range and then charging back in to get the rage generated by charge when you don't have enough rage to slam, and you don't have any overpower stacks, and you have rend up and mortal strike is on cooldown, and you're not about to have a melee swing land. If you're able to charge weave properly, then yeah, you should probably take sudden death, because it will likely be a better outcome. But I think that that is a big assumption to assume that you're going to charge weave properly, because as I just mentioned, there's a whole lot of variables that you have to contend with to be able to decide that, yep, this is the time that it is okay to charge weave. And if you decide to charge weave at a time that is not optimal, then it drastically reduces its value. And if you do it at a really bad time, then it can be a DPS loss overall. And this, of course, needs to be done within the context of doing mechanics for a given encounter. So given all this, I think that there is a very real possibility of people not being as good at charge weaving as they think they are. Because you need to make a decision about whether or not to charge weave really, really quickly. Or you need to basically be planning ahead and expecting that, like, okay, if I don't have an overpower proc here, then I'm charge weaving. And so it's really easy to either forget to do it or do it at a suboptimal time. But ultimately, if you think that you can charge weave properly and you're not going to screw it up, then, well, yeah, go ahead and do it. But you probably didn't need me to tell you that because if you're good enough to really get charge weaving down right, then you probably already have an understanding of, like, what's good and not good for a warrior. Unless you're one of those people, I would honestly still recommend that you use Skull Splitter in raids if you don't have Wind Fury until you're completely confident in your ability to do charge weaving during a fight without it compromising your ability to do mechanics. 
which brings us to the sort of real reason why I wanted to make this video and just have this big old ramble, because I really like thinking about the logic that you use to make decisions. And so let's talk about some of my decision making logic, because I think that while having an understanding of why I'm recommending certain things will be useful to you. And if you're using my videos to try to make decisions about what to do, I'd argue that it helps to understand when you would want to listen to me versus when it's time to make a comment telling me that I'm an idiot. Because ultimately, you're the one who has to make the decisions about what you want to do and what you feel is right. Because while, yes, we have these things called sims, we have raid bots and we have sim craft and etc., sims aren't the full picture. It's making assumptions about what the game is like, and it's also making assumptions about your ability to play the game. And those are really important things to understand. And so how you deal with the fact that, okay, we have this idea of what it means to be perfect at the game and what your gear could be capable of via the sims, but then you have to try and apply that information, that knowledge, to be the best at your spec that you can. So let's pretend that there are two main specs that you could go. Spec A does 10,000 DPS, and it only requires you to hit three buttons, and it's pretty easy, right? You just hit one, two, three, and then repeat. So it's a three-button spec that does 10,000 DPS. Now let's say spec B does 11,000 DPS, but it requires you to hit 11 buttons, right? There's 11 different buttons, and if you don't do it in the right order, then you're going to do vastly less DPS than spec A. The question is, well, which one's better? The answer is, if you can play spec B properly, if you can do it right, it is better. But if you can't, then spec A is better. And that is a really important thing to understand. It's like, okay, how good am I actually at this spec? What can I do the most DPS at? I think that a lot of people make decisions about how to play this game based off of what the optimal quote unquote thing is to do rather than what's the best thing that I'm able to do, which is not always the same thing. Now, because I'm nowhere near as good of a player as I used to be, I tend to make a lot of decisions about how to play a warrior thinking around the assumption of, okay, well, what happens when I screw it up? Because I have a knack for finding new and exciting ways to do something wrong. And I hate doing things wrong, so I want to find ways to minimize the chances of me doing it wrong. Even if it means that the maximum possible DPS that I would be capable of doing will be lower. So to be a bit more concrete and explicit with this, I have a tendency to place more value on looking at the loss of DPS associated with doing something incorrectly than I do on the value of doing it properly. So obviously, Sun Death versus Skull Splitter is a great example of this because the Skull Splitter is a lower risk of screwing it up because you don't have to charge weave because, well, you're going to be using Skull Splitter in scenarios where if you didn't have it, you would be charge weaving. So you don't have to worry about the, the swing timer. You don't have to worry about all the other stuff. It's much less complex and it's harder to screw up. Another example of this that immediately came to mind when Tom made his comment was that on my Fury Warrior guide, I recommend that if you are enraged, you should always use Raging Blow over Bloodthirst. And then if you're not enraged, that's when Bloodthirst takes priority over Raging Blow. Now, a lot of people in the comments were saying that, hey, pretty much all these other guides are saying that if you only have one charge of Raging Blow, then you should still use Bloodthirst over Raging Blow. And if you even look at the SimCraft APL, then you're going to see that that's exactly how it does its priority system. So why did I recommend that? Well, the thing is, is that if you look at it, and if you look at the cost-benefit analysis of doing simply Raging Blow is always better than Bloodthirst if you're enraged, versus doing Bloodthirst over Raging Blow if there is still one charge available of Raging Blow. When I compared the two, it's a 100 DPS difference, which is in reality a 1.27% difference in DPS with prioritizing Bloodthirst over Raging Blow at one charge being the winner here. Now, the reason why I still recommend doing Raging Blow over Bloodthirst when enraged is because it's just so much easier to process that in your head, right? You don't need to worry about the charges. Am I enraged? Yes. Use Raging Blow. That's it. That's all you gotta worry about. There's no extra complexity of worrying about what my charges are at and also considering whether or not I'm enraged. I just simply say, if I'm enraged, use Raging Blow over Bloodthirst, because then you can spend all of that extra processing power that you aren't spending thinking about your charges on focusing on boss mechanics and stuff like that. Now, obviously, if you're good enough to be able to understand the differences in why you would pick one option versus the other, and you're capable of doing both options without screwing either of them up, well then, yeah, pick the one that does higher DPS, to be a little bit even more hand-wavy with things. Whenever you're doing min-maxing, there's two components to that, right? There's the maximizing the benefits and minimizing the negative parts. And there are people who are much smarter than I and much better at finding those maximizing little tricks. But it seems like the act of trying to minimize the negative effects is 
something that gets somewhat neglected. So I figure, well, why not lean into that and try to provide some value to the warrior community by sharing my ideas on how to operate from that perspective. But the funny thing about ideas is that most ideas that you or I will ever have will be wrong, which is why I always ask you to tell me why my opinions are dumb, because, well, they probably are. Anyway, I don't really have a good way of concluding this video, so I hope that there was at least something enlightening about it. Keep posting great questions, keep telling me why my opinions are dumb, keep giving me ideas for future videos. Oh, and as a bit of a thank you for those of you who, one, want to get better at charge weaving, and two, actually listened all the way to the end of this video, I put a link to an unlisted weak aura that I made at the bottom of the video's description. It's really simple, it just has a bunch of triggers that make it so that it'll only show up when it is a good time to charge weave. And with that, I just want to say thank you for watching this video and subscribe for more.